Anyway, I am glad to be with you all. Good morning, OCC. I hope you're having a great morning. I know you are, because if you were here for worship. What? Woo, goodness. It's so good. Sometimes I'm like, Lord, can we just linger here a little longer? It was so good just to think about the simple goodness of God. What, what a powerful moment for the collective gathering of the believers. And I think that it is so apropos for that to introduce what we're going to be talking about today. And that is really our call to be the church that Jesus has asked us to be. I think it's one of the disconnects in our culture today that we have equated church with just the building or just the singing or just the teaching and don't understand that it's not something we attend, it's who we are. That alignment is critical to us being able to fulfill the power and purpose that God has for our lives. Recently, I had to go to the chiropractor, A, because I'm not 20, but also because I was doing something regular. As you get older in life, you get injuries just from living, you know, just... What happened? I was walking. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I woke up. It was Thursday. That's what happened. So (laughs) something was going on, and I work out a lot. So I was like, I'm fit. It's fine. But then by day two or three, I didn't want to, you know, take medicine anymore. I was like, okay, let me go see the chiropractor. So I go, and I talk to her, and I I was like, something is not right, and we've got to fix it. And so she said, well, first of all, I want you to come to these scales. And uh, for the ladies in the house, you know that's a little offensive because you're like, wait a minute. What does that have to do with, with why do you need that information? Well, I'll give you my social security number before we talk about my weight. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, is this medicinal? Like, what, what do you need to know why? She said, just trust me, trust me. So I walk in, and I don't see a regular scale. And those of you who are chiropractors or in the medical profession, you probably know what I saw. I saw two scales that were attached, and she asked me to stand one foot on each scale. I'm going to cover the number because last, last uh, service AV was kind of pity. And, you know, I don't. It's not my testimony time, so that's not, that's not relevant. But she asked me to put one foot on each scale, and the goal was not to see my total weight, but she wanted to see the distribution of my weight. Now, I was amazed to discover that one side of my body registered 19 pounds heavier than the other. 19 pounds, y'all. Ideally, your weight is supposed to be split in two, and that's the numbers that should show up on, on each scale. Your weight divided by two. But my weight distribution was 19 pounds heavier on one side. So clearly, I was out of alignment. And it made sense because on the outside, you couldn't tell. My size was still the same. I still looked fit, but I couldn't function in my everyday life. So if I wanted to play with my kids or pick up things or or do things that allow my life to be lived to the fullest, I couldn't do that. There was an alignment problem, and the issue is that you couldn't tell by looking. It's not like I was limping or leaning to one side. It looked fine to me, but the scale showed me something different. And she said that as we begin to make some adjustments and get you in alignment, you will start to see a more even distribution of your weight. See, because if it's not balanced, then you can't live in the fullness and the purpose and the power of your life. You might look good, but you're not going to be living full. And that's not the goal, just to look good, right? We want to live to the fullness of what God has called us to. And for us, there's many ways that I know that we have to be realigned with Jesus. But particularly right now, I want to talk about what it means to be the church. Because right now, we've got people leaving the church in droves. For the first time in history, America has less than 50% of its population that claims to be members or attenders regularly of church. People are saying, oh, it's irrelevant. Uh, They don't care. There's been too much abuse of power, immorality. The church is not speaking into current cultural issues. But here's the thing. I I don't mind if unbelievers who don't know God are choosing not to be in church right now. That's not the issue. The issue is people who say they are surrendered and submitted to Jesus Christ, who start off their explanations with, I love Jesus, but God knows my heart. But do you know his? Because the heart of God says that church is not about what you do on Saturday or Sunday or the parking lot you drive into or the building you walk in or the seat you sit in. The church is the calling of the Christ follower. And we're going to see that in a couple of passages today. We're going to be in Matthew 16, so you can see the establishment of this church that Jesus Christ built. And then we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, so we can see what a healthy church looks like. 
Because, y'all, this is critical. And today is not about guilt. I'm not trying to beat anybody up. Y'all know I love you. But today, we're going to talk about the real issue of why believers believe that church is optional and how we cannot fully represent Christ in the world if we don't understand the role of church. I've already come to the table not needing one amen. I don't need a clap. I don't need an affirmation. Because I love you more than I need to be affirmed by you. So today, there's a word on my heart that I believe God has for this body so that we can live out to the fullest what he's called us to do. Matthew 16, 13 through 18 is where we'll start. This is the the birth, the prophetic moment where Jesus is talking to Peter. And he says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, says, now Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi. He was asking his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And in verse 14, he says, and they said, some, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Next verse. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And then in verse 16, Simon Peter answered, y'all say this with me, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Let's say that one more time. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, I want you to hold tight to that because that's going to be important. And in the next verse, Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, not Simon Peter. He's kind of starting to change the name because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Verse 18. Also, I also say to you that you are Peter now, no longer Simon Barjona, Peter, which means uh, Petros in Greek, it means a small rock. And upon this rock, it's a different kind of rock. This is a big boulder, something immovable. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, this is a huge statement. Before we get into the book of Acts and we see the actual birth of the church, we see this prophetic moment where Jesus is speaking a calling over Peter's life and then says, because of your calling, I'm going to build my church. Now, he says, I'm changing your name. And in the Greek, like I said, that means a small rock or a pebble. But when he says, upon this rock, I will build my church, it's not upon Peter. It's upon something solid, something immovable. It's the same word that was used to describe the stone that they had to roll away in front of the tomb of Jesus. Something heavy, a boulder. So many theologians, many commentators would say he's referring to this confession of faith that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But it's not Peter. That's the point. The point is Jesus is building his church on something solid. He's using a man, but he's not building it on the man. He goes on to say, I will build my church church. Y'all, this phrase is everything. Because first you see possession. I. Jesus says, I'm not going to use the help of men to build the church. Men build buildings. I will build the church. You can plan programs. You can facilitate experiences. But I Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, the one you just declared, I will build the church. This is a matter of possession. This is why church is not just about this gathering and coming to this building, because anybody can sit in these seats. But the church that Jesus is talking about comes with possession. I know that because you go to church doesn't mean that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And it shouldn't mean that because the church building is a place for unbelievers and seekers and explorers, those trying to figure out who God is. We want you in the building. But the call of the church is for the believer. That means you have already declared that Jesus is the one who possesses me. He says, I will. Y'all say will. This is a guarantee. Now, if you know of an instance where Jesus has made a promise and not kept it, then we can talk about it. But he says, I will, no doubt, this is a promise, I will do it. It's coming, which also tells you that at that moment, the church was not yet established. There are many who will argue that the church today should look like the Old Testament church or even a church before the church established in Acts. And this futuristic prophecy tells you that even at this moment before his death, the church that he's talking about didn't exist yet. I will build my church. And again, we see possession. I will build my church. Now, I'm not going to build your church. I'm going to build my church. Not only am I the builder, I'm the owner. See, some of us get stuff built, but then we don't really own it, or, or some of us own things that we didn't build. Jesus said, no, I'm the builder and the creator, and I'm the owner. All of it points back to me. 
So if you are not affiliated with me by grace through faith and complete surrender, if I'm not Lord, then you're not my church. So it's not where you go and it's not the size of your gathering. It is your affiliation to a surrendered life to Christ. Now, this is important, y'all, because the reason why the church gets misunderstood, or the church itself can't explain why it's supposed to be the church, is because we have made this umbrella, this huge umbrella, that if you just know God, the culture loves God. God is not the issue. It's Jesus Christ. He's the one that came to bring division. He's the one that you have to make a decision about. See, many religions and many ideas can talk about God, and we love God in light, God in positivity, God in vibes, God in energy, God in whatever else you're doing. I just do this good thing, and then I add God because he's nebulous. This ambiguous. We don't have to really define him. But when it comes to Jesus, you have to declare that he is either crazy or he's who he said he was. That he can't just be a good prophet. He also has to be Lord. He has to be the one who conquered death. The one who lived blameless. The one who was fully man, fully God. The one who took our sin. The one who conquered death. The one who promises a resurrected life. Who gives us eternity in heaven. And if you claim that, you also have to lay hold to the conviction that comes with Jesus. Jesus is not just a a partner that comes along and blesses what you do. Jesus is not just worthy of glory when, the, when you close on the house and when you get promoted or when you get engaged or when you get pregnant or when you get healed. or when the, That's not Jesus. Jesus says, listen, if you know me, there will be benefits in your life, but my job is not to bless your life. Seek first me, the kingdom of heaven, the things of God, and then things will be added to you. We have not represented him well. And that's why the culture is like, I'm through with church, because they don't know what it is. And as believers, we don't know what it is either. We just go because I feel good or because I've always liked it. Oh, she can preach. He can preach. They can say, that is a meeting. And it's great. But you, as a Christ follower, are the church. He says, I will build my church. And that word means ecclesia. So he's talking about someone or a group of people that are called out, and it also means an assembly. So he's saying, I, the builder, promise that I will build a possession of mine that will consist of the called out people, those who have chosen me as Savior. Called out means that we are in the process of sanctification, which means salvation is already a done deal. But here's another problem. I love, y'all love the church. That's, that's, why I, that's why I do what I do. But we, we have dropped the ball in some places. And we have not made salvation clear. So people can't articulate the gospel. People don't know if they're saved. They just know they're regular attenders to something. But they're not sure if they have committed and surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. And so when they're trying to live sanctified, when they're trying to grow spiritually, they're wondering why we have all these disconnects. Well, this thing might just be good for morality. The Word of God is good. But you need the power of the Holy Spirit to live out this life. And if you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to be trying to change your behavior with nothing but frustration. And we're scared to ask people, tell me how you came to know the Lord. We say, are you a Christian? They say, yes. Everybody's a Christian. Are you a Christ follower? Tell me when you surrendered to the Lord. Is he your all and all? Is your life centered around him? Is he the convictor of your soul? Is he the determination of your decisions? Is he the decider of your fate? Is everything you do for his glory? Are you willing to give it all up if it makes him look good? I want to know, do you, do you love Jesus as a Lord? Because we love to be called a friend of God. That's my friend right there. Jesus said in John 15, you're my friend if you obey my commandments. So he said, this thing is not because we're peers. It's because I don't have to lord my authority over you if you're obedient. So you have to be called, set apart to be the church. And here is the promise. Y'all say promise. Y'all, this is good. He says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. 
Yeah, so somebody don't understand. He's not just talking about hell, right? He's not talking about salvation and justification, which is important because when we get saved, we're justified. We are no longer headed to hell. We're headed for heaven. When we die, eternity with Jesus, that's, that's amazing. He's talking about a Greek God that was called the God of Hades that was a, the uh, idea of the power of death is what he's talking about. So he's saying, I will build my church and the death, the power of death will not ever be able to conquer my church. Now, let me tell you why this is powerful. Because he's not saying the gates of Hades will not overpower you. That wasn't a promise to Peter. That's not a promise to the individual. If you know anything about church history, it's full of martyrs, full of people who have died for the cause of Christ today. Because by the way, if somebody tries to tell you church is irrelevant, tell them to, to get out of America. Because it's only irrelevant when we have 52 options. Because we got 17 pastors that we scroll through every Sunday. And so we just feel like we go where we want to go. And if we don't find the person saying exactly what we want them to say at the right time, then I'm moving on to the next thing. But anywhere outside of America, people are so desperate for the rescuing grace of God, the church is blowing up. People are risking their lives, not risking their friendships and their popularity, not complaining that service don't start at the right time, not complaining about styles of worship. They're trying to stay safe because their lives are on the line. So the church is fine. I want us to be a part of it, not because God needs us, but because God wants us. He's saying the gates of Hades will not overpower it. He's saying, I'm calling you to something that will outlive you. Because you might fail, you might falter, but the church won't. And for every horrible church experience, I can give you 100 more that are thriving in the name of Jesus. He says, this is mine and I will build it and it will not fail. The church is the only thing promised to remain until Christ comes back. Most of us will die, but the church will not. So we need to understand that the author, the owner, the builder of this thing, if we are called out, if we are the assembly, if we are those set apart who lay claim to Christ Jesus, we are the church. Now, since we are the church, we need to be about the business of making sure that when the church gathers, it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Not because we stand in judgment, but as a family, we have a call. Y'all, this is critical. So when people say, I love Jesus, but, stop right there. You can't say, I love Jesus, but I steal. I like to steal. He just knows my heart. You know, I, I love Jesus, but, you know, I just, every now and then I might kill you. If you get on my nerves, that don't make any sense when we pick extreme things like that. But when we start to get into the subtle things, I love Jesus, but I have a hard time forgiving. I know. Oh, that's, I know. We understand that. I have a, I love Jesus, but I don't, I don't like uh, giving to these churches because last church didn't know how to handle my money. Well, see, what, what's happening is you've just said that I'm going to take an experience I've had and elevate it above the establishment that Jesus gave. You're, you're saying that because I have experienced the poor execution of the gathering, I'm going to dismiss the entire establishment of the church. You're saying I have given people, men and women, so much power that whatever they did to me, I cannot work through it to fulfill the call that Christ has on my life. I have elevated them so much, and I was a part of their church and not the church of Christ. Because if I was a part of the church of Christ, when my family failed me, I would ask him, am I a part of the solution? Am I a part of the problem? What are you doing here, Lord? If you're calling me to leave, it will be done decently and in order and to your glory. And when you call me to leave, you will call me to another family because you don't call me to be an orphan. So when you call me to leave, you're showing me where to go. And when I go, I'm going to still leave well. And the people who hurt me, I'm still going to honor them as leaders because I'm a part of your church, not their church. And they can only hurt me so deeply because I don't give them that much power. I know they are tools to be used by you, but only you are God. So we carry around all this baggage and we think we get the right to deselect. Colossians 1.18 says, Jesus Christ is the head of the church and we are the body. Show me a headless body and I'll show you a healthy Christian that's deselected from church. You don't get to deselect from the head. You say, where do I go next? How do I handle this? Just like anything else. We throw away it. We throw that away like we throw away marriage, like we throw away relationships. This is not good. I'm done. Jesus says, it's my church and you're mine. 
I may have you physically a part of a particular meeting, but you are mine. And so whatever's happening among human beings that, oh my God, have failed and make mistakes, you ask me first how I want you to handle it. And whatever happens next will be to my glory. And it won't be something you gossip about. You won't be bitter about it. And you won't have unforgiveness in your heart. And you won't be angry because I will be the one heals you and restores you and opens the next door for you. My church is what he said he's building. So then we go to Acts chapter 2, and we get to see this prophecy come to fruition. Acts chapter 2. These few verses will be in verse 41 through 47, Acts chapter 2. It says, so then those who had received the word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Next verse. They were continually, continually devoting. Y'all say devoting? Devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, the first idea you're going to see in these verses, Acts 2, 41 through 47, let me give you a framework because you always want to know the context of Scripture. What has just happened is that Peter and John, earlier in Acts chapter 2, Pentecost happens. Because in Acts chapter 1, Jesus said, sit still, don't leave Jerusalem. I want you to be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Samaria, and the other uttermost parts of the earth. The Holy Spirit is going to come. He's going to give you power. Remember when I was talking about the Spirit in John 14 and 15, I said, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to give you a comforter. He's going to bring you my truth. It's this whole thing. It's the progression of God's plan. I'm going to leave. The Holy Spirit is going to come, and then you're going to be my witnesses. Then in Acts chapter 2, we have Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit comes, tongues of fire, flames are distributed, languages are spoken, people can't explain it, and the church is born. Right after that, full of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, Peter and John go to the gate called Beautiful, and they see a lame man who's been begging for 40 years, asking for alms. And they say, listen, we don't have silver and gold, but what we do have you, what we do have I give to you in the name of the Lord, walk. And so all of a sudden the healing and the miracles are beginning to take place as the church is born. So now Peter and John got folks upset because they had devout men. The scripture says, if you read Acts chapter 2, these were church folks. Devout men who were upset. That they were doing all this healing and whatnot in the name of this Jesus. But what they did was they took advantage of this opportunity for the attention. And after they were released, because they couldn't find a reason to keep them very similar to the life of Christ, they released them. And the people said, wait a minute, what, what must we do? <laughs> Peter said, I'm glad you asked. They didn't say, you need to come to my church. You need to come to my conference. You need to ask God for a better. He said, repent. That's what he said. He said, oh, you were impressed with that healing? That's nothing. Repent. Repent this day and choose Jesus as Lord. Because anything that's happening here, I'm not trying to impress you. I'm trying to invite you to something that will change your life forever. That's the purpose of what's happening in Acts. So now we get here to the end, of the, end of the end of the chapter, and we're starting to see this continuation of this explosive growth of the church. They were continually devoting themselves to some things. This is how we know when a church is healthy. Not perfect, y'all. It's not going to be perfect. You want a perfect church? Go to heaven. Listen. <laughs> and until then, yeah, you're just not going to have it. But you can have a church that's devoted to the things that God's asked us to be devoted to. Devotion. And then you're going to see the display of God because of this devotion. First thing they're devoted to, y'all, is the apostles' teaching. All right. Now, this word is important. Y'all say teaching. Now, please note, they were not devoted to the apostles. Y'all talking about some amen like it don't happen. They were not devoted to the apostles. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. And these apostles are not who we call apostles today. And this is not about shade. Every church and denomination has different reasons why they give names to offices. I'm not even going down. It doesn't matter. The point is that these men were men who had been with Christ, who were humble, who were gifted, not grieving the Holy Spirit, able to give insight to the Word of God. So the teaching wasn't just whoever wanted to teach. It was people with the capacity and the gifting to teach. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to do it a certain way. But the problem is we take lightly the gifts of God. And there is a reason why we're devoted to the leader's teaching. This is one of the signs of a healthy church, that we have the teaching consistently of the Word of God. They're not teaching their own truth. They're teaching God's truth. 
When you do not have that and you're left to your own devices, this is how we come up with different doctrine. Now, here's the promise. Here's the beauty. What you need to know in Scripture, you can know. God makes it all plain. I, I am the chief of the uneducated. I have not gone to seminary. I have business degrees. I have nothing to do with the Bible. But God is faithful if you're diligent. So I'm not saying you need to be all that. What you need to know, you can know. However, there are going to be things in Scripture that God gives a capacity to certain people to be able to give insight to. So, for example, I'm watching this uh, young lady that I follow on Instagram. You got to follow folks, y'all, that not, that not just Jesus loving people. Get, get out the bubble, all right? So I follow her, and it's not because she's a, a super superstar Christian. I'm just out of the bubble. I can't know what's going on in the world if everybody I follow looks like me and thinks like me. Gosh, the Christian bubble is the most dangerous place to be. So follow some people that don't look like you and not so you can be like, oh, Lord, look at this world's coming to. So you can say, my God, show us how to speak to this hurt. I know what they're looking for is you, Lord. What they really want is you. How do we speak into that? So I'm watching this young woman in this journey, and she is really loving Jesus on her own, just says, come to know the Lord and talking about all this. And she's got millions of followers millions. So she talks about Jesus and the Bible and all these great things, and everybody's like, yes, you're amazing. And then she posts something particular not too long ago where she was trying to understand a, a challenging topic in Scripture. Uh, it's a challenge for many people who've studied Scriptures for years. It's one of those things that's just a challenging topic. I'm not going to get into it because you're going to try to Google it and find it. So it was a challenging topic. We know there are many challenging topics in Scripture, right? There's things that come up, whether it's prophecy or end times or Trinitarianism, all these things that come up. If you start studying, you'll be like, mm, I don't know how that makes sense. So she gets to this point, and so she decides um, that she's just going to research the Bible and come up with some conclusions. So she researches Scripture, and she puts this long post out, and she talks about some things in the Old Testament, things in the New Testament. So then what her conclusion was that this particular verse in the New Testament is not how we think it is. It was misinterpreted because she found all this other evidence in the Old Testament. Now, here's the problem. She was wrong. She was real wrong because some of those things are not so easily understood. Now, remember, what you need to know, you can know. All of those great un things that are hard to understand, they're not necessary for heaven. You need grace and faith for that. And what you need to know, you can know. But that does not mean that as you're taking an inspired, God-breathed word written by many, many different people across many different time eras through various cultures in different styles as God was revealing himself in different ways. Mountain God, Ten Commandments God, Ark of the Covenant God, Tabernacle God is not the same God, not the same way God reveals himself in the New Testament with grace. These things are changing and shifting, and you've got to know what that meant in that time before you know what it means today. So if you're not astute enough, you will just draw conclusions. And sometimes they're peripheral conclusions. They don't, make, they don't matter. But sometimes they're doctrinal. And so she draws a conclusion and all the comments, oh, my gosh, thank you so much for explaining this. I've always wondered what this meant. I never understood it. Now I know I'm so blessed by you. Here's the problem. She's not a teacher. She's a learner, which is great. We all are still learners, but some of us have the gift to teach. And when you do those things in isolation, you're not in any kind of community, you're not under any kind of leadership, you're going to draw whatever conclusion you think is best. We've all come to conclusions on our own, reading scripture or, or hearing something, and then as we learn and grow among each other, we realize we might have been a little misguided. But when you're only left to your own devices, you are the final word. More importantly, all of these millions of people that follow you if they are not in community, you are their final word. And so now you have a bunch of individuals listening to anybody's teaching, taking it as truth. So they're like, I don't need church. I'm good. But you're not. Because when you're in a healthy context, under healthy leadership, with the gifting of teaching, what you're hearing is people who have been submitted and surrendered to what God has to say for that group in that time. And even if they make a mistake, when you're in this body, if I get up here and say something too far to the left, I'm going to get emails and texts and somebody's going to say, uh -huh, I don't know, that's quite right, Jada. We might need to talk about that. You know why? Because that's what community does. We sharpen each other. We don't take the final word of one individual even the ones with the gifting. Other leaders will challenge me. You will challenge me. And together we will be able to grow in the teaching of God's word. 
But when you have isolated things, and by the way, because we are in a culture of Christian celebrity, you need to understand that social media is not set up to promote the most informed. They're set up to promote the most interesting. You don't have to be right to be interesting. They're not set up to perform the people who are accurate. It's set up to promote the charismatic. So if you draw people, you will get a following. It's not based on credibility, it's based on charisma. So you have to understand that there is a reason why people have those platforms. Sometimes it is the mighty, gracious hand of God blessing his servants. Sometimes it is somebody who just has the thing that appeals to everybody in this moment and they've not been tested by anything of merit. So it cannot be our only source. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching, but here's a context for that. And to what? The fellowship. You cannot be a Christian talking about I don't do people. Everybody that laughs is convicted. You cannot. Oh, you can't reach a certain age talking about no new friends. I'm good. I don't need. Listen. She's trying to be my friend. I'm out of friend. Listen, no. Uh, my friend group is closed. You know how we get. Tell me, who is that? Oh, uh-uh, uh-uh. No, no, no. No, I just, it's a table for four. No, we don't have any new, nope. We don't have any space for you. Now, this is not just something social. Because we love to call any kind of gathering a fellowship. For some reason, it sounds more spiritual. I don't know why we don't just say party. It's a party. Nobody has a birthday fellowship. It's a party. But we love to call it a fellowship. It sounds holy. Listen, I'm not talking about just a social time with snacks. And I'm down with snacks, but that's not what's happening right here. What's happening right here is intentional, common building, intentional, common ground, community. This thing that says, I will place myself in the presence of God's people because we are about the business of glorifying God. And we might not have the same personality or the same preferences, but we are headed in the same direction. So when you isolate yourself from people, for whatever reason, maybe your personality, your temperament, or maybe you've been hurt, what you're doing is you're shutting down one of the vehicles that Jesus Christ uses for his church. Now, I love going to dinner by myself. Can I tell you one of my favorite things is going up to that hostess stand, and when they say, how many? I'm like, one. <laughs> and if you hear us getting loud in the back, we're having a good time. Because I love myself, and I love going to dinner with myself because we agree on the same place. We want to go at the same time. We pick the same food. We make the same decisions, and I say, what do you think about this? And myself says, I think it's a great idea. And I say, I agree. And it's a wonderful time because me and myself don't ever argue. But something changes when I invite somebody to the dinner table. Do you see what I'm saying? I got to deal with somebody who might not want to eat where I want to eat, who might not have my same taste, who might not have the same dining expectations that I have, who might inconvenience me, can't meet at my time, lives out of the way. All of these things happen when I invite people into my space. But here is what else can happen. Divine opportunities for the glory of God. And sometimes he's saying that person that's rubbing you wrong, or by the way, the person that you are rubbing wrong, I am using for my glory. In the safety of the fellowship of committed believers, I can teach you how to deal with people who don't think like you. I can teach you how to handle healthy conflict. I can teach you how to love people who don't see life the way you see it. So when you get in the real world, and you have to deal with people who are not like you and also are not my church. You know how to do it in love. But if you live in isolation, that's not a matter of temperament and personality. You're making a choice that says this avenue that Jesus Christ uses for his church, I am deselecting. And how in the world will they hear without a preacher? Sometimes you are the one that they will hear the word of God through. And sometimes you are the one that needs to receive the word. So it cannot just be about the convenience. I, I love the fact that we have virtual experiences. But if you are never in the body of the believers, 
How can you participate in the one another's? How can you love one another, bear one another's burdens, pray for one another, intercede for one another? How can you do that if you're disconnecting yourself from everybody that you haven't known for 20 years? This is intentional fellowship, y'all. And that's why we leave room at the table for those who might not know God. It's in those moments that the body of Christ can be the church. They were dedicated, devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, and also to the breaking of bread. Now, this piece on communion, y'all, is massive because you know what it means? It means they were not just concerned about having a better life. It means that they were taking moments to dwell on the sacred and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We do communion here twice a month. Some of you might not know because it starts at the top of service. That is not shade. There are many, many reasons why we can't quite make it in at service time. I have children. I like to blame them often. So if you don't have children, think of something else. But there, I know we all have struggles. But we have a whole communion, crackers, juice, a song, a word. It's a wonderful time. And we do that because we need to pause for a moment and think about the cross. And if you're more excited about the topical teaching that gives you a better marriage and helps you manage your finances and makes you a better parent than you are about the cross. There's no wonder that the world is confused as to what the church is. The cross puts everything in perspective. See, when I'm coming to God, even if there's things I'm wanting from God, even if there's pain I'm bringing to God, there's something about just lingering on a perfect Savior who chose to leave heaven take on flesh, endure betrayal and abandonment, rejection, physical abuse, a criminal's death, hang on a cross while being perfect and blameless. Then to defeat death and to be resurrected, to ascend into heaven and to leave his spirit with us so we might live for him. When I think about that, It makes whatever I still want from God a little less important. Because let me tell you something. If you want a better life in Jesus, it comes through salvation. The fact that you are not headed to hell but to heaven at death, that's a better life. And if he never does another thing, the cross will make it all right. The cross casts a shadow over whatever is happening in this life and gives us perspective. And when I'm mad at my friend, I can't stay mad long because at the foot of the cross, she's not behind me. We're at the same place. When I'm mad at those who are oppressed, those who are evil, at the foot of the cross, they're not behind me. We are all equal at the foot of the cross. It is the sacred things that elevate the thinking of the church. And so when we see hurt in the world, people that need hope, we're not promising them a problem-free life in Jesus. That is the lie of all lies. We are promising them that if life does not change, even in the valley of the shadow of death, you can find comfort because he's with you and his presence is greater than the answer to your problem. And even though his provision will blow your mind sometimes, his presence is still better. And even though his healing will just create mysteries and miracles, his presence is still better. That's what breaking of bread does. Then it says they were devoted to prayer. Now, some of y'all grew up in church where they had prayer services, and they would tarry, and it caused some trauma. That's why y'all like, if I never pray again, I'm going to text this prayer to the Lord and just, my Lord. Because sometimes you'd walk in there two hours in, and they still warming up. Musician hadn't even got there yet. Then the organist show up, you know you're about to go into round two. Folks coming off their job, third shift, still in prayer meeting. Because we had these long prayer services. Because let me tell you something. When you need stuff from God, you don't mind spending long hours in God's presence. But when, when all of a sudden you become affluent and, and you're educated and life's not that bad, then your prayer life becomes something that's relegated to the sidelines. And it's only in crisis that we run back to God. But he says they were devoted to the breaking of bread and prayer. They were devoted to spending time before God because just like the cross, that's a sacred activity that gives us a perspective that lifts us out of what's happening in this world. 
The reason why people don't understand the role of church is because we have diluted it to some place that you go to fix your life. And I'm telling you, Jesus says, I am the fix for your life. And when you gather among believers, you will encourage each other with praise, things I've done. You will encourage each other on things I've yet to do. But that's what it means to be in the body, to pray, to intercede for one another. So here's all the devotion, the things that the church was devoted to. And here's the last thing. The next verse says, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Y'all say awe. You should say it like awe. (laughs) You might, I mean, I don't want to offend anybody, but yeah. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Might be rough with if you have a mask on too. Um, And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Y'all, masks changed the game. They changed the game. Oh my gosh. Um, Kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Here's the last sign of a healthy church. That they stay in a state of wonder. That they are constantly amazed by grace. That grace never gets old. When you start thinking about all the things... God knows, y'all. He knows you. And he still calls you. When you think of the things this month or this year that God has not exposed, when you think of the things that you've done or things you've thought and God has not brought punishment for them, he's given you grace and blessing. When you think about all of the ugly habits toxic relationships, unhealthy choices, and God says, I'm going to see you through it. When you think about all the loss you may have suffered, grief that should take you under, that should have taken your sanity, that should have taken your health, and you're still here somehow. You stand in awe at the presence of God. You stand back and say, God, how can you love me so? So when the church doesn't spend enough time standing in awe of God and we're more in awe of the people who lead the church and we're more in awe of the position that we hold or the power that we have, we're more in awe of the following of the church, there's a problem because a healthy church stands in awe of God. It's something about his presence, y'all. That should make you pause every now and then. Even if you've walked with him 20, 30 years, it never gets old. Every time I'm amazed at the goodness and the wonder of God. And he wants his presence to be overwhelming to us. This, is, this word awe, do you know what? In scripture, it's only mentioned about 36 times. 31 of those times, it means fear. So this is not like God is really cool. It's not that. It's like, oh my God. This is the great I am. And when he told Moses, take off your feet because you are standing on holy ground. Not that the ground is holy, but because I'm here, everything I'm around becomes holy. And that even though you're my servant, Moses, you still can't see my glory. It would kill you. You can't live and see my glory is what God says. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to let my glory pass you. And then you can just catch the tail end since you want to see something. And even the tail end of the glory changed Moses' appearance. It says he came down off the mountain and his face was glowing. This is the same God that, that struck a man down dead for reaching out for the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God. In the Old Testament, he's like, listen, don't touch the Ark of the Covenant unless you're appointed. And Uzzah was trying to be helpful, y'all. It looked like it was about to fall. It sounds so simple. Struck dead. And you might look back, especially in our culture where, you know, we, we don't like to be offended and everything is, is harsh. We're like, Mm-mm. God, that seemed a little harsh. Did he have to kill the man? When you ask that question, you don't understand the holiness of God. Because when I understand the holiness of God, I don't ask, how could a good God allow suffering? How could a good God allow these things to happen to us? How could a good God allow me to experience this? When I understand holiness, I say, I cannot believe that God gave me another day. I cannot believe that the way I dismiss God, he still blesses. I cannot believe that we have not all been swallowed up by the earth by the way we diminish who God is. I can't believe he still loves me. When I understand the holiness of God. That's, that's why the hymns used to get us through some things. And I love new stuff, but old stuff had theology in it. 
It was amazing grace. It was, oh my God, when I in awesome wonder, just consider the works your hands have made. It's the awe, y'all. And when a church doesn't have that, we're moving towards something unhealthy. Because nothing should take our breath like the presence of God. Nothing should blow my mind like the presence of God. And here's what happens when we have that devotion to the Lord. The rest of these verses, Acts chapter 2, verse 44, says, And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. This was the belief that bonded them, y'all. So it's okay to have people who are not Christians be in your circle of friends, but you need to know they are not the church. So don't expect them to live like those who were surrendered to Christ. You are winning them over. You're not trying to make them be righteous and they haven't surrendered to Christ. You're not trying to hold them to some standard and they have not chosen salvation. You're trying to win them over to the love of the Lord. The problem is when we as believers form bonds with people who don't believe what we believe and try to have things in common with them, God doesn't mix well with others. He's like, I am God and I'm God alone. If we're not heading in the same direction, then we're not in community. We can be friends, but this divine, fe- this divine fellowship is for those called to Jesus. Because here's what's going to happen next in Acts chapter 2, verse 45. And they began selling their property and possessions. Somebody just logged off. Y'all like, dog on it. <laughs> That's enough for me. Thank you. And they began selling their property and possessions, not for profit, and were sharing them with all as anyone might have a need. Now, exhale. No one's asking you to sell your stuff. Y'all didn't miss the whole rest of the message. Like, are they about to say, I knew this church. That's why I don't fool with churches. They want you to sell your stuff, give your stuff to them. And come back with me. Come back. I am saying that this is a sign of a healthy church. Generosity. Mercy. Because when God puts a body together then he finds needs that can be met within that body. In the same way that our bodies very often are fighting off sickness that we don't even know we have because we have healthy bodies that are handling things before they even surface. He's saying that's the role of the body. It's not the role of the organization of this gathering. Yes, leaders and staff, and we use tithes and offerings to bless the people's lives, but that is not just come to these people, the church, the government, the whoever, for a handout. If you are in fellowship and community, you'd be surprised how many people God has put in your path that can meet the needs of the body. I can't tell you how many stories we've had of life groups where people needed cars, homes, rent. And before it ever made it to the church as a request, God had blessed someone beyond understanding in the group. And before they spent it, because when you get extra, you ask what to do with it. Before they spent it, they realized that there was a need for it. So what happens is you're not just a hoarder, you're a conduit for God's generosity. And because the church has been greedy and not generous, then the world is like, I don't need that. I can do greedy by myself. What they need to see is a church that is generous with its resources. A church that gives as God leads them to give. Because then the world will see something that's different. That's the thing that doesn't make sense. That God would give money and success and promotion and access to people so they could bless the people in the body. That's what the early church did. And so they were sharing with them all, as anyone might have need. And then we conclude these next couple of verses. Day by day, continuing with one mind. Y'all say one mind. In the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. In verse 47, it says, praising God and having favor. Y'all say favor. With all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day, those who were being saved. Let's go back to 46 real quick. It says they had one mind in the temple. Y'all, this is unity. I'm not going to live here long, but this is one of the struggles with church. Because we love divisiveness. 
And unity is what we've been called to fight for. And I don't mean sameness. It's not a cult where we're all chanting the same thing. We don't all suddenly have the same personality. We are who we are, but now we're headed in the same direction. Jesus Christ said in John 17, I want them to be one as you and I are one. It's the name of our church. It's where we got the name from. Because oneness is something that's critical to the call of Christ, but we have not taken it seriously. Because if we did, we wouldn't gossip the way we do. And if we did, we wouldn't accuse the way we do accountability is not accusation and you don't have to expose somebody's business before you bring it to them and you don't have to agree and co-sign with other people's complaints and you haven't even experienced it you're just saying yes because it sounds good and sometimes you got to tell the person you love I cannot listen to this have you talked to that person Because let me tell you something, you can have great programs and great information and the enemy knows that you cannot see the favor of God without unity. So he'll keep everybody in this room separate on their own path, doing their own thing and not able to function as the church. Because look what happens after they have one mind. In verse 47, then it says they got the favor of the Lord and he was adding to their number. Here's the problem. We get this whole passage in reverse. We want the increase and the favor first. And then we don't want to live in unity. We don't want to have hard conversations. We don't want to be checked when we're wrong. We just want to leave under the radar, talk about people, call it a prayer request. Act like the person already knows. Oh, oh, I wouldn't even say I thought you already, you didn't know he was. Oh, well, real quick. He, uh, (laughs) why, why? It's a privilege many times that God allows you to be exposed to the weakness of somebody else. What are you going to do with that? I hope you're handling it the same way you'd want them to handle when they're exposed to your weakness. It, leaders or not, everybody needs to be challenged. Everybody needs to be prayed for. Unity is something that you have to fight for. Even in the church as you read through the scriptures, constant fight for unity. This is a sign of the church because the world says you only hang around people that look like you and think like you and agree with you. And the church says people who look nothing like you came from different backgrounds, have different thoughts, different understandings, different experiences, but worship one Christ. That's all the unity we need. That's what the church is supposed to do. And then you see the favor of God after you're devoted to teaching and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer, standing in awe of God. Then you see the display of the miracles and the signs and the wonders. Because remember, the awe came before the signs and the wonders. They were not in awe at the miracles. They were in awe at God. The miracles are just something that keeps them on the mission pointing people to Christ. Here's the thing, church. I think that, number one, we need to understand what Scripture says about who we are. That church is not about attendance. It's about adoration. Number two, we need to be able to explain to others that church is not something you go to. Uh, Nobody needs to make you feel guilty for not driving to a building, but you do need to make it your business to be devoted to these things so that you can live out the call of Christ. And for a lot of us, there's pain that's associated with that. Some of you here today might not be regular attenders. Maybe this is the day you just dropped in and you're like, oh, Lord, this this is what we're doing here. This is what we're doing here. There's a lot of things that are holding us back. Can I tell you something? There are promises in the Bible that are only for the church. The gates of Hades will not overpower it. The love of Christ that he has for the church, that's the standard for how a husband should love his wife. That's how powerful it is. Do you know all the spiritual gifts are for the church? That's why Paul goes extensively to explanation saying, listen, if there's tongues, interpretation, prophesy, edify the church. If you're going to edify, edify, edify the body. If it's not good for the body, do it at home. Because those things are for the church. And do you know at the end of the story in Revelation, it is about the bride of Christ, his church coming to him. He prepares a supper, and the bride of Christ is revealed to the world. This is my church. This has been my representation on earth. But we got to get to the pain that has us out of alignment. Let me tell you something. When I went to that chiropractor and she had me standing on those two scales, And I asked her, help me understand how this distribution of weight works. How do you know what to fix? And she said to me, well, if the pain that you're having in your body, Jada, is on the heavier side, the side that had the 19-pound difference, I know it's probably something chronic that's been going on for a long time. Like your weight or your structure, your bones, anything, because now the, the pain is really a result of whatever is out of line. But if the pain is on the light side, 
I know it's probably something temporary and you're leaning into the heavy side to compensate for the pain. Maybe an injury, something happened recently. But here's the thing, whether the pain is long-term or short-term, it has to be addressed. And so whether you grew up as a child and you had trauma and you saw foolishness in church and you were hurt and it's something that you've carried with you or you've been deeply disappointed in your recent years as an adult and you're compensating to lean away from that pain, can I tell you something? It is only in Christ Jesus that we can stand in spirit and truth, that we can stand in freedom and forgiveness, that we can be healing and still be a part of the body of Christ that we can be growing and still learning about what God has called us to do. It is the balance of the believer that allows us to be in the alignment that God has for us as the church. Ladies and gentlemen, this world needs to understand that the call of church is bigger than any one person, bigger than any one movement. And we're not looking for reasons to discount the church. We're looking for reasons to advance it. And it will prevail. And I want the people that gather with the Assembly of One Community Church to be a light to the world. And not just come because we feel good, or because worship is great, or because uh, they love Pastor Conway, or they love props. But because we are the church. And when we come together, there is power that we do not have when we're apart. There is purpose that is only for the church. And I promise you, because you're here today... If it doesn't apply to you, there's going to be someone God brings in your life, if he hasn't already, and they've left church, and they're hurt by church, and they've been disenfranchised, and the Lord has you here today so that you give explanation bigger than you should just go, so you can call them to an invitation by the owner and the builder of the church, and that is Jesus Christ himself. In Jesus' name. Come on, can we give it up? I'm glad to be called, y'all. What a privilege to be called. Do I have any privileged people who understand that they are not worthy of the call of Christ, but it is a gift that he would see fit to use us, that he would say, you are my representation to the world, flaws and all. We thank you, Father, for your grace and your favor. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for the painful parts of our testimony. We thank you for the healing that we've not even started because you give us grace. We thank you for the forgiveness. Would you give us this freedom, God, so that we can fulfill the call of the church? The world is desperate to see the American church with all of its accoutrements, with all of its affluence, with all of its privilege, rise up and give you glory show us how we start within ourselves realign our devotion so you can display your mighty hand through our lives and through this gathering in jesus name amen let's give god glory y'all